Okay, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, our next speaker is the, the pride of Penticton, BC, Mike Whitaker. <laughs> and he's going to talk about Pancre duality of self-similar actions. Right. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. And I, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, the organizers of the fields, uh, the thematic program. So I was here in 2007, and uh, in some ways it was uh, career making for me. I mean, I met, as the video said this morning, there was uh, a lot of interactions that I had, and it was uh, a very special and uh, memorable experience. And uh, and for me, the field is synonymous with George, and so I'd like to thank George too. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and Ken, but Ken wasn't sitting at the top of the stairs every time I went up. So, it's, uh, that's, uh, but thank you, Ken, too. Uh, okay, anyway, um, right, so uh, I'll talk about uh, some duality of self-similar actions. Uh, and here's the plan. So I'm going to introduce self-similar group actions. Uh, then I'm going to tell you about uh, some K-theoretic duality for smell spaces, and then tie it all together uh, at the end. So let, for George, let's start with the theorem, since uh, he likes this. Uh, okay, so what we're doing is we're generalizing a result of Nekoshevich in 2009. So he proved that if you start with a contracting self-similar group that's regular and recurrent, uh, then you get two Kuhn-Spinzner algebras, and those two Kuhn-Spinzner algebras uh, are strongly Morita equivalent to Smail space Caesar algebras, the Ruel algebras, the stable and unstable, and uh, in that case, they turn out to be dual to each other in a, in a, in a sense of KK or Poincaré that I'll explain later. That was introduced, uh, well, uh, by Kahn and others uh, back in his big red book. Okay, and our, okay, so let me mention my co-author. So this started some time ago. We invited some uh, Brazilians over to Australia and we got together and tried to prove this theorem and we ran into uh, various problems. It was difficult for us. Um, and the, over, over the years, the project stalled out and got started and stalled out and got started. And, uh, and uh, I was in Glasgow and uh, a student began working with Shin Lee, so Jeremy Hume, who I understand was an undergraduate here. And we got to talking and uh, he has some ideas about how this might go. And, um, and so we quickly added them to the project. And okay, so let me, let me say, uh, what the result is, and then I'll, I'll say a little bit about how Jeremy contributed. So, um, okay, so if you start with a groupoid acting, a self-similar groupoid acting on a graph that's regular, uh, then you get the same result as Nekrashevich. So the first thing to notice is that uh, recurrent is gone. So recurrent was up here and that's gone. And that was 100% uh, Jeremy noticed this. So he noticed that all our results could be skirted around and uh, we could get rid of recurrent, and then the generalization uh, was all of us. So anyway, it's, uh, it's really nice when young people can make such a valuable contribution and also get the paper out the door, of course. Right. Uh, okay, so let me explain more about what's going on. All right, so here's the introduction. So I'm going to do it in the self-similar group case, and it all extends to self-similar groupoids acting on graphs or but not groups acting on graphs in the sense of excellent Pardo. So there's a little snag there that we needed actually uh, faithfulness at a vertex at some point. And, and so we needed, to, we needed to use the groupoid picture. Yep. Did I? Oh, okay. I meant groupoid. Yeah. All right. Typo number one on slide number one. All right. Excellent. Excellent start. Okay. Right, okay, so if you start out with a, a, a finite set, x, and, uh, and then you let x star denote the, the finite words in that, we say that if a group acts faithfully on uh, x star, then it acts self-similarly if for every group element g and every element of the alphabet, there's a new element of the alphabet y and a new group element h, satisfying this relationship one here hard to get this straight. 
Okay, and, uh, and so how do we interpret this? We interpret this like reading a ticker tape, or like an automaton. So we take the group element, we read the first letter, it spits out a new letter, and then we get a new group element that uh, tells us how to keep acting. So in such a way, uh, group elements are elements of the automorphism group on X star. Okay, and uh, faithfulness of the action implies that H is uniquely defined, and so it's defined exactly by X and G, so we may as well give it a name depicting that, and so we call it uh, G restricted to X, and we give it this little symbol here. So we can reinterpret this relation by uh, G acting on XW is G acting on X, G restricted to X acting on W. So this new group element just gets us this new name. All right, so let's give let's let's have some examples. I mean, this is this may not be totally familiar, so uh, let's let's get started with that. So if we start if we take the alphabet to be just zero one and uh, and the group to be the integer z, then this we can describe a self similar action by just looking at what a generator of z does. So this is what what we're really doing is we're describing an automaton. So I'm telling you what A does to the letters, and then I'm telling you how it restricts. And if I do this, then you can turn this into an automorphism, and then you can take the group generated by that automorphism. And that's exactly what's happening here. Okay, so A acting on zero is one. That's what this says. A acting on one is zero. A restricted to zero, well, there's nothing there, so that's the neutral element. A restricted to one is A again. All right, and this holds for every, fin every finite word uh, W, and then, of course, we can look at how this works in practice by uh, just looking at A squared, say, acting on this word, and you can go ahead and read the formulas. So I think you'll see pretty quickly that this is, okay, so I put it at the top as the odometer action or the adding machine. So what is it? It's adding one in binary with carryover. That's it. So this is the, the, the bog standard example uh, of a self similar action. And of course, this, this is a very important and interesting example. I mean, this is a counter minimal system. Uh, it has lots of nice properties and so on and so forth. And I'm gonna try and convince you that you can get lots of other interesting groups uh, in the same way. All right, so here's the one that got this whole thing started. This was uh, defined by Grigorchuk in 1980. So he, uh, he gave us four generators, A, B, C, D, he gave us the action, I won't read it out, you can, you can read it. Um, and he proved a bunch of stuff about this, this action. So what did he prove? He proved in particular that the generators all have order two, so a squared equals b squared equals z, d, c squared equals d squared equals zero. And there's this nice little relationship, so cd equals b equals dc and so on. And using this, he managed to prove that actually the Grigorchuk group is a finitely generated infinite two torsion group. Okay, so every element, it's infinite, so there's an infinite number of elements in G. You, you have to take the relations that are imposed on you by being an automorphism. Okay, and, uh, and every element has torsion in the sense that G to some power is zero, and that power, of course, depends on G. Okay, so this wasn't the first example of an infinite. Uh, torsion group, but it was one of the very early examples, and I think the simplest to write down by far. Okay, he, he then proved in 1984 that this group has intermediate growth, and that answered a question of Milner from 1968, and really sort of got this whole area started. All right. Um, oh yeah, by the way, ask questions if, if you have them. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer during the talk. Okay, uh, so another really nice example is the basilica group. Uh, so again, we let x be x, y. Uh, we have these generators, and, um, and you form the group uh, from these generators as subgroups of the automorphism group. And if you do this, uh, you also get some nice properties. So here they are. This is torsion-free, has exponential growth, no free non-amenable subgroup, non-abelian subgroups. And it's not elementary amenable. And in fact, Grigorchuk's group also has that property. It's amenable, but not elementary amenable. And Grigorchuk's was the first uh, to have this property. 
And uh, Bartholdi and Virag, so it was open for some time, whether this was amenable or not. And Bartholdi and Virag proved that it is in 2005. And as far as I know, this was the first time that random walks were used to prove amenability. And of course, this got uh, an entire area started uh, once they did that by Kaimanovich and others, for example. Okay, so we have to consult the legal department as always. So uh, I, I told you that we have some restrictions on Ethereum. So here are what the restrictions are. So the first one is that this action has to be contracting. So what does that mean? That means if you give me a group element, I can tell you, I can give you an N so that once I restrict that group element far enough, it ends up in some predetermined uh, finite set S. Okay, and this is a very standard uh, condition. It really allows us to handle um, the, the algebra. And in particular, it, it, the uh, Kuntz-Pinsner algebra we'll see later is finitely generated if, uh, if we Im invoke this condition. Uh, the second one is one that we removed. So I only put it up just to, so you could see that it's kind of a strong condition. So uh, it's like level transitivity, but a souped up version where it's not just level transitive, but also I can find any group element after being level transitive. Uh, and then the one that's quite important is uh, regularity. So what does this say? So if I'm now looking at the infinite words, so that should be an X infinity since I uh, was trying to take it from graphs to, to an alphabet, but okay, so typo two if, for Karen who's counting. Um, so for every Y that's a fixed infinite word by an element G, there has to be some open set around that fixed element that is also fixed. And that's called regularity. And, uh, and that's actually not, that's a bit subtle. So for example, the Grigorchuk group is not regular, unfortunately. So the two other groups are regular. So the Basilica is regular and the, uh, and the odometer is regular, but the Grigorchuk group does not satisfy that. So that does not satisfy the conditions of our theorem. Well, so, yeah, but, 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 well, that's right. So it's, it's an action. And when we make a CSAR algebra, we're going to care about both. But the group element, the group theorists only care about the group. So, but the group is defined by its action. And that's what faithfulness does. Oh, yeah, sorry. So it's a, a self similar group action is regular. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should be repeating these questions. So, um, so yeah, so George is asking, uh, he was confused about the, the notation when I say something multiplicative is zero. So a squared is zero. I mean, just inside the group then. So a squared acts like the identity on finite words. Okay. Okay, thanks. Good, okay, so uh, something that I find absolutely fascinating about the, these groups is uh, that they come with spaces in some, to some extent, and not just the space of the, you know, the counter set of infinite words. Um, okay, so what do, how do we define this? So this was defined by Nekoshevich, and what he did was he, he turned around the words, so he wrote them instead of as right infinite words, he wrote them as left infinite words in this way. Uh, and if you start with a contracting self similar group action, you, put, you can put an equivalence relation on these uh, left infinite words. So you say that they're asymptotically equivalent if the two left infinite words satisfy the condition that at any finite stage, there's a group element that moves you from one to the other. I should be using my, that moves, that moves you from one to the other. And Provided that, that that set of group elements that does that is finite, then they're, uh, they're asymptotically equivalent. Okay, and I'm gonna explain this uh, relationship more, thorough, more thoroughly by uh, giving some examples soon. 
All right, and uh, if we take the quotient space, so we mod out by this equivalence relation as we often do, uh, we call this a limit space of the self-similar action. And it turns out that this was proved by Nekrashevich uh, in the, in the self-similar group case and then extended to the uh, groupoid action on graphs case by us. But uh, if you take a contracting and recurrent uh, self-similar group action, then its limit space is a compact connected metric space. And here I've, I've, I've added recurrent and that's recurrent is really needed to get connected here. All right, and of course, uh, we are taking a quotient operation on a shift space and we can uh, move the shift map down and we get a dynamical system in this way. Okay, so there's a nice way to understand these limit spaces. I mean, it seems miraculous that you start out with a counter set, you take some quotient operation, everything gets glued up, and at least to me. Um, and so the way to understand them is Schreier graph. So what you do is you take a contracting self similar act, group action and you define a graph. And that, that graph at level n is uh, given by the words of length n, those are the vertices, and the generating set moving between those words of length n give you the edges. And in some natural way, the limit of this sequence of graphs will give you a, a, a picture of the limit space. So here we go. So here's the odometer action. Okay, so here's the words of length, uh, length one, the words of length two, and you can see this is starting to look a bit like roots of unity on a circle, isn't it? And, and that's the correct interpretation. So you're always getting roots of unity on a circle, and if you take the, well, okay, so the limit that you have to take is actually the Gromov-Hausdorff uh, limit, or the Gromov-Hausdorff uh, boundary of this, uh, okay, you glue together all these Schreier graphs, take the uh, Gromov-Hausdorff boundary, and that's the sense in which this really is a limit. But you can also see it geometrically just, if you just ignore the technical details and look at what this sort of converges to, you won't be far off. All right, so this converges to the circle. And interestingly, if you take the complex function f of z equals z squared, then uh, you can, Nekrashevich showed us how to make a self-similar action out of this. So it's called an iterated monodromy group. And the action that you get is the odometer action. And this limit space gives you a way to go back. So you can now take the odometer action and recover the Julia set of this complex function. And that's general. So Nekrashevich did this for any post-critically finite rational function. So he started with this post-critically finite rational function, makes a group, and then the limit space of this group is the Julia set of that post-critically finite rational function. So amazing to me. I mean, his insight uh, never ceases to amaze me. Okay, so let's look at the basilica. So in fact, the basilica is the iterative monodromy group of z squared minus one. Yes, Don. Can you spell or state fully the iterated monodromy group or whatever? Iterated monodromy group. Yes, I can spell it. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, so the question was, can you spell or say solely the word iterated monodromy group? <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's it. Good, good. Okay, so this is the comes from z squared minus one. And let's look at how this how this converges. So we here's the level one, level two, level three, level four, and lo and behold, it's converging to the Julia set of z squared minus one. It's it blows my mind every time. Even flipping through the slides, I get excited. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, as far as I can tell, nowhere. I, I, can't, I cannot see where, it's, where the group sees it geometrically other than this uh, Schreier graph. That's, that's, for me, I mean, probably Nekrashevich has more insight, but... Uh, 
Yeah, let's throw that out to the audience. All right. Yeah. So the question was, how does Nekrashevich? I, sh I should be repeating this. The question was, how does Nekrashevich see, or how does anyone see, this z squared minus one happening at the level of the group? And the the answer is, that I don't know. I mean, I see it through the Schreier graphs, but I don't. I can't see it beyond that. Well, that's true. Well, but yeah. that makes it even worse. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so George said that a z squared minus one is additive and the group is multiplicative, so this makes it worse, and I agree. Okay. So onward and upward. Uh, so we want to understand these through the lens of smale spaces. And so here's what a smale space is. It's a hyperbolic dynamical system, and Ruel gave a purely axiomatic description of this system in terms of bracket maps and, uh, and some axioms. So here they are. So the, what the bracket is, I won't read them out for you, but the bracket is locally defined. So you have to have some global epsilon. And if your points are within this epsilon, then you get this bracket map and that describes a product structure on your space. So it gives a local product structure everywhere. This not global, typically not global. Okay, and here's with the actual product structure. So you define this XS set. So that's S stands for stable and the XU set, U stands for unstable. And for example, the XS set is all Ys so that the bracket of, that they're close enough and a bracket of YX equals X. And similarly for XU and in this way, the bracket map defines two canonical directions for you and, uh, and this is, these are them. And on those directions, so the S and U aren't for nothing. Uh, so on the stable direction, if you apply the dynamics to two points that live in the same stable direction locally, then they're gonna move closer together. They'll both move to some other stable set, but closer together. And similarly for the unstable. So we, we can't say local matters here. So we can't say they move farther apart, we have to say the inverse moves them closer together in the unstable direction. And that's the smell space. So locally, a, a space that's locally hyperbolic in this precise way. All right, and here's a picture of the bracket map. So you, you know, if I take X and Y, and I take the bracket of X, Y, they're close enough to do this, then that's exactly the unique point where the local stable set of X meets the local unstable set of Y. And similarly, YX, so the local stable set of Y meets the local unstable set of X. All right, and these are all over the place in dynamics. And, uh, and here's some examples. So subshifts of finite type, solenoids, substitution tiling spaces, Smale's horseshoe that, okay, that's conjugate to the full two shift, but um, hyperbolic toral automorphisms, and finally the limit space of a self-similar uh, groupoid group. Okay. Well, not, okay, it's not the limit space, it's a, it's a solenoid construction over that, and I'll say that uh, more precisely soon. All right, and from such a, from such a equivalence relation, well, okay, we can define a global equivalence relation, so we can extend the local uh, stable and unstable set to be global in this way. So, and this is, I should say, this is due to Ruel, Ian Putnam, and, uh, and then further down, Putnam and Spielberg. Okay, so uh, V and S are stably equivalent, uh, if and only if eventually these two points move together arbitrarily close. And, and, and similarly, they're unstably equivalent if under the inverse map they move together to be arbitrarily close uh, as, as we take a limit. Okay, and if we start with a finite uh, phi invariant set of periodic points, we can actually find an abstract transversal in these groupoids that makes, uh, makes it uh, a tau groupoid. And this is exactly where Putnam and Spielberg came in. They wrote a JFA paper some time ago that introduced uh, these two groupoids, um, the stable groupoid and the unstable groupoid, proved their tau and proved all kinds of nice, uh, nice properties of them. 
Okay, and they're independent of, of this initial set P up to uh, groupoid equivalence, so in the sense of Muley, Renault, and Williams. All right. Okay, we can make C-star algebras out of these in the usual way. So we define a convolution product, we define involution, and we represent them on uh, Hilbert space. In this case, we have a really nice one, xh of p, and, uh, and then we complete in the operator norm, and we get some C-star algebras. So these are the, the stable and unstable C-star algebras of our smell space. Okay, and uh, we have a uh, uh, automorphism on these CSER algebras. It doesn't matter that much what the CSER algebras are. They're of course important, but um, you know, the, take these groupoids, complete them, and uh, and and see what you get. And the the CSER algebras that we really care about in this talk are uh, these Ruel algebras. So this the action of the group extends to an a covariant pair of a unitary and the and the Caesar algebra and we so, and hence we can take a cross product and we get uh, the stable Ruel algebra so these were defined by Ian Putnam and this unstable Ruel algebra uh, here and these are the guys that we want to use uh, to prove the theorem all right now I've removed a lot of the sort of nuances of KK duality. I'm, I'm not a KK expert by any means. So if you have too many questions, I'll throw it out to the room. But, uh, but yeah, so here's, here's uh, KK duality or Poincaré duality uh, in if E is isomorphic to A opposite. So if you start out with two nuclear c algebras, you can take the tensor product A tensor B and it doesn't matter because which one you choose because they're nuclear. Um, if you can find a k-homology class and a k-theory class satisfying these funny relations where this tensor product is the, is the Kasparov tensor product, uh, then you say that they're k-k dual or Poincaré dual if uh, B is isomorphic to the opposite algebra of A. And the, the point here is that this induces group isomorphisms between the K theory and the K homology of A and B. And this, is, this was defined by Kasparov and, and then Kahn. And it really is, you know, want more evidence of having a non commutative space. So if, you're, if your Caesar algebra satisfies Poincare duality, then this, is, this, this tells you that you should think of it like a non commutative manifold. And let's uh, see some examples. So Kasparov, Kahn, Scandalis in the 80s uh, proved uh, this for commutative c star algebras in that sense. Kahn in his big red book gave the first non-commutative example of Poincaré duality for the irrational rotation algebra, my personal favorite algebra. Um, and uh, I should say that Anna uh, at the back and Heath Emerson only recently explicitly wrote down the K-theory class and this was, this is really nice. So, I mean, Khan is always right, but, uh, but he didn't bother to write down the, the K-theory class. And it's important when you have a duality like this, because in order to take uh, computations, you actually have to look back here. So you actually have to take the Kasparov product with your cycles. And if you don't know what your cycle is, then that's going to be hard to do. So it's a really important result of Anna and Heath to actually write this down. Okay, Kamiker and Putnam uh, in 96 proved that Kuhn's-Krieger algebras satisfy this duality. Uh, Heath Emerson proved that if you take a hyperbolic group um, satisfying certain hypotheses and, uh, and look at its boundary, the cross product satisfies Poincaré duality, so it's dual to its opposite algebra. Uh, Popescu and Joachim Zacharias, who's here somewhere, um, proved this for graph and higher rank graph algebras. So this is, of course, an extension of this Kuhn-Krieger algebra um, result. So, uh, and then we proved. Uh, so, in my in my thesis, actually, we proved that the stable and unstable Ruel algebras are, are are satisfy this duality. 
Okay, and that's the result that we're going to use here is this one. All right, so we haven't said too much about CSER algebras yet. We, we talked about smale space ones, but what are the ones that we care about? Well, these are the uh, self-similar CSER algebras, and this was originally done as usual in this business by Nekrashevich. Um, so if you take a self-similar groupoid action on a finite strongly connected graph, then you get a, a kunz pimsner algebra defined by families of partial isometries and a family of partial unitaries, UG. In the group case, these are obviously unitaries. And, uh, and, the, and in the case of X, these are isometries, such that uh, UG is partial unitary, SE is a Kuhn's-Krieger representation of the graph algebra. And then they have this amazing uh, relation, this commuting relation between them that's exactly mimicking the self-similar relation. So remember, G acting on EW is G dot E, G restricted to E. And again, I have not gone back to uh, the X notation, but this is, this is a graph here. Okay, and uh, Nekrashevich back in 2009 proved that this C star algebra here is strongly Morita equivalent to um, the, the unstable Ruel algebra. And this was in his Crella paper, and it's a, I find it a, a difficult paper to read, but uh, that's the result in it. In Krieger? Oh, it's probably spelled IE, and I just misspelled it. Oh, no. That's, okay. Sorry. Thank you, George. Number three. There we are. Yes. Thank you, George. So George uh, has pointed out that I've misspelled Krieger here. Uh, apologies to Krieger, of course. Uh, okay. Um, right. Okay. So what about the other algebra? What about uh, the stable rule algebra? All right, well, Susie Wheeler in 2014 uh, proved that if you ever take a space, a compact metric space, V, and, uh, and G, a continuous surjection, satisfying certain axioms. So this is a generalization of being expansive, and this is a generalization of being an open map. Uh, if, you, if you satisfy these two things, then, and it doesn't matter, I don't want you to read the formulas too closely, then uh, you can take uh, a space, so you take the inverse limit of this space, xv up here, so you, you just, it, this is just a standard inverse limit, and you define a map on it as follows, and she proved that if you ever have a space satisfying these, with a map satisfying these axioms, then you get a smale space, and that smale space has totally disconnected stable sets. So she can, and moreover, she completely characterized such spaces. So all such spaces come with a pair V and G. So this is a really, really nice result and has, you know, attracted a lot of attention, at least from people like me that want to study CSER algebras of these guys. Okay, well, in this case, uh, so, in some previous work with Robin and uh, Magnus Gofang and Brahm Meslin, uh, we proved that if you start out with a locally expanding local homeomorphism in this way, then you can define a kunz pinsner algebra from this data. And, uh, and so we've called that OVG. And we proved that the stable Ruel algebra is strongly Morita equivalent to this kunz pinsner algebra. Okay, so that's pretty good. So all we have to do is prove that this limit space, remember we took all this uh, time to define this limit space, it has a shift map on it. So if we can prove that that shift map satisfies Wheeler's axiom, then we get not only a smale space, but also uh, the, the result that we want. And, and that's what we did. So uh, here, 
Nekoshevich did this in 2009 without Wheeler's axioms or any of this uh, nice stuff, but he used a topological description of snail spaces due to Freed. Uh, here we use the, we just nailed it right on the head. So for Nekoshevich, he didn't actually even have to define a metric on, on the space. For us, we did, and that's hard. I mean, quotient metrics are, are kind of difficult. And anyway, so uh, we, we have this theorem here. And so we have two uh, Kunz-Pimsner algebras. We have the Kunz-Pimsner algebra of the limit space, and that's uh, isomor well strongly Morita equivalent to the stable Ruel algebra. And on the other hand, we have the other guy. And here's the theorem. So again, I've just said it from the beginning. So if you take uh, this Kunz-Pimsner algebra of a self-similar action, then uh, the first one is KK dual to the kuhn spindler algebra of the second one uh, with the limit space. And these, these real algebras satisfy, the, so they're purely infinite and simple, and hence they're Kirchberg algebras. And, uh, and so um, you can actually prove, you can use BombCon and other things to prove that if the rank of the K-theory is the same uh, for these two for the stable or unstable algebra, then actually uh, you get an isomorphism between using Kirchberg Phillips between the, these two kuhn spindler algebras and uh, Proyeti. Pro so, and uh, Makoto Yamashita managed to prove this in generality um, very recently. So, the result is on the archive, I think, but not published. Okay, so let me give an application. Okay, so for the odometer, here's what we, ha what we have. We have this, um, we, we have the Schreier graphs that converge to the circle, recall. And it was, uh, it's an old result by uh, Yi in his paper, K-theory for C-star algebras of one-dimensional solenoids, how to compute the K-theory for these C-star algebras, for these Ruel algebras, at least for the stable Ruel algebra, and hence now we can now we know the K theory for the uh, well. This gives us our result gives us another way to compute the K theory for uh, the unstable Ruel algebra, and hence we know the K theory for all these algebras in between. And this also holds for all these examples coming from iterative monodromy groups. So they all satisfy. Uh, such a theorem. And so if I know how to compute the K-theory for one of these uh, post-critically finite rational functions, then I know the K-theory for all the algebras that are related. So, and, and in particular, I know that I can use only the data of how the, how the, uh, the function acts on its Julia set to compute this, right? Because the Julia set has been proven to be topologically conjugate uh, to the limit space by Nekoshevich again. And hence, uh, I, I understand if I can compute the K-theory for these post-critically finite rational functions using the Julia set description with the function acting on it, then I get everything else in sight. And in fact, uh, our co-author Jeremy Hume has shown how to do this. So he, show, he, he has a very recent paper that computes for very general uh, maps on complex, uh, on the Riemann sphere, how to compute the K-theory. And so, uh, and he gives an explicit description of this, and hence, we now know how, what, so all those uh, self-similar groups that you get from those particular examples, and there's only, uh, some examples that come through because we need this condition of being post-critically finite. Um, but for all those examples, we know the K-theory of the generators and relations uh, self-similar group action. Okay, and let me give you one final example. So I'm a little bit early, but that's all right. So uh, one final example of how one might apply this theory. So let's just say I randomly write down uh, okay, randomly, it takes a bit of work, but I write down uh, an action on a graph. So maybe I put the graph up here. I did not put the graph. Uh, okay, so 
let's work out what the graph is. I, I believe the graph is this. Uh, and uh, you. Uh, what is it? So it's uh, this. So we have zero, and we have one, and then we have two, three. So that's the graph G in question. And how am I moving it around? So I'm moving it around by some generators, so A, B, and C. So zero maps to two, uh, one maps to three, two maps to uh, but by, so remember I have a, a generator for each vertex because I'm taking this groupoid picture. So A is only acting from this vertex V to this vertex W. So A moves all paths that, uh, with range V to all paths with range W. And it does it in that way. And then I get the, the restrictions that I have here. B is going to map from W back to V, and it moves two to zero and three to one. And C also maps from W back to V, and it moves uh, two to one and three to zero. Not super important, but uh, I can look at the Schreier graphs of this action, and let's see what I get. So uh, I get the, the level one Schreier graph looks like this, and the level two Schreier graph looks like this. And the level three Schreier graph looks like this. And are you seeing a little bit of a resemblance to something we've seen before? So the level four Schreier graph looks like this. And now I'm just showing off my, sorry? It looks like a Julia set of Z squared minus one. Exactly, exactly. So I'm also showing off my tick skills here. Uh, but right, so this looks like the Julia set of Z squared minus one. And in fact, the, you can prove that the, the dynamics on it is exactly the same. And hence, from two picture descriptions, we know that this random uh, group action that we wrote down is actually the Caesar algebra of that. The Kunz-Pinzer algebra with generators and relations is strongly merely equivalent to the one for the basilica group. And with that, I'll end. Thank you.